Hi, this is Dr. Wysong. This series of videos on the big questions of life will show where each one of us is led if we dare to leave behind preconceived ideas and see where reason and evidence lead. Religions cross-pollinate. In my college years, I moved from the Christian religion of my parents into the prevailing academic, evolutionist, materialistic, and atheistic view. Then in my early medical years, I discovered some of the evidence and logic on origins presented in the previous section of this book. This then convinced me that there had to be a creator, but I didn't know where to go from there. Lingering childhood church memories led me to think that if I wanted to know more about the Creator, religion was the place to look. It would then be just a matter of finding out which religion was the true representative of the Creator. I examined various religions and holy books. A cursory review of critiques of non-Christian religions written by Christians and Bible proofs used by Bible apologists led me to believe that the Bible was the Creator's Word. After all, I reasoned, the Creator, like a human father, would surely want to talk to its creation, including me. So I settled on a Bible-based religion that seemed most rational and faithful to the book. I was somewhat uh, content as long as I didn't entertain critical views or thoughts from others or myself. In fact, reading any materials critical of this religion was considered a serious breach, even evil. I immersed myself in Bible study, apologetics, and critical evaluation of religions other than mine. I had no born-again Jesus movement, though I tried. Instead, I was engaging my rational and academic side, since truth was my goal. The mountains of literature this Bible religion provided consumed me and left little room for exploration of outside sources. And, as I reasoned and as leaders told me, why would I go there, since my newfound religion was supposedly the truth? As long as I confined my study to all the proofs and reasonings provided to me, I had no reason to believe otherwise. However, I reasoned if I had the truth, I shouldn't have any fear of any information. That is, other than a devil jumping out of the pages of literature critical of my religion and possessing me. And really, I, I was taught to believe that threat was actually there. Nevertheless, I was more convinced that I had nothing to fear if I kept truth front and center. So I then widened my exploration. The discoveries that resulted, epiphanies for me, would have been fine if kept to myself, but I couldn't. Besides, all my fellows in the congregation espoused fealty to truth. How could I keep truths I was learning from them? At this time, I had become the leader of the congregation for a rotation. So I was hesitant to do anything like that, and, and I didn't. This bordered on apostasy with the impossible punishment of official ostracism. The result was a visit and a trial of sorts by a representative from the religion's headquarters. This only further encouraged my groaning doubts. Compliance, not truth, was the real agenda. So after about three years of immersion in what I was led to believe was the truth, I moved on. The break was not nearly as clean and neat as that sounds, nor was it easy to leave behind so many friends, although several I spoke to about what I was discovering fell away along with me. The routines, the sense of belonging, the camaraderie, they were powerful, but I had to admit that I had been naive and wasted so much time. Looking back, however, the experience was invaluable in waking me up to independent and open thinking and giving hands-on experience with being willingly brainwashed. It's also made me realize how difficult it would be for readers of this book who are committed to religion to entertain this challenging information. Leaving behind a religion you commit to can be like having your world collapse in on you. My apostasy and heresy were originally based upon finding scriptures that contradicted the accepted doctrines of my religion. Then, after leaving this religion, my exploration widened to include challenging the uh, very notion that the Bible was written or inspired by the creator of the universe. 
What follows in this and the following chapters will be very challenging for Bible believers. The facts presented are not of my origination, but are freely and easily available in literature and on the Internet. I encourage you to explore and examine the pro and con arguments. Yes, you'll be able to find someone somewhere who defends your belief with apparent erudition. But if truth is your goal, consider the source and check for biases. For example, don't expect a professor teaching evolutionary biology and receiving grants, salary, fame, ego-stroking, audience, power, and with authored evolutionary books and other literature at risk to give intelligent design a fair shot. Similarly, you wouldn't expect theologians, priests, ministers, and others intimately tied to religions with salaries, ties, university positions, prestige, power, and authored books and literature, all at risk to give challenges to the Bible and Jesus a fair shot. The best sources are those with no ties of livelihood at risk, or those willing to forsake it all for the truth. And that's a rare commodity. In examining the earliest moorings of Jews and Christians, I was surprised to learn that virtually everything in the Bible was known and practiced in cultures prior to the Bible. This would include Minoan, Egyptian, Indus Valley, Etruscan, Greek, and Roman civilizations. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Hymn of Ra, the Gilgamesh Epic, Ovid's Metamorphoses, the uh, Enuma Elish mythology, and many other religions and mythologies cross-pollinate the Bible and other holy books. Features of gods, some dating back thousands of years B.C., include a heroic male demigod, often the son of a god and a mortal woman, miracles surrounding the birth, atonement, original sin, births announced by stars, birth at a December 25th solstice, which was common in the Greco-Roman sun gods, tyrants trying to kill the demigod in infancy, passion and violent death, bearing sins so humans could rise to heaven, rising from the dead, worshipped by wise men, fasting for 40 days, baptism by water, 12 followers, miracles such as water walking and changing water into wine, The demigod being referred to as king of kings, lamb of God, alpha and omega, the truth, the light, and likened to both a lion and a lamb, resurrection to eternal life, considered a savior and redeemer, and on and on. In the printed version of this, you'll see significant lists of doctrines that pre-existed the doctrines of the Bible. For example, a list of crucified saviors that came before Jesus gods who became mortal and uh, ascended into heaven. Many gods before Christianity were worshipped as a trinity, like the Jesus, Holy Spirit, God, Christian trinity. For example, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Horus, Isis, Osiris, Astarte, Anat, Kradesht, and a variety of others. Other pre-Christian doctrines include holy water, confession, penance, salvation based upon belief, priestly garb and ritual, Sunday worship, Saturday worship, temples, sacrificial blood, wine as blood, Eucharist communion, idolatrous reverence for holy writings, the cross symbol, three crosses with thieves to the side, halos, tithing, the Christmas tree, Easter, an end time apocalypse, eternal punishment, a devil, hellfire, and more. Just consider one of these gods, the mythological god Addis. 1250 B.C. B.C., that is. That's 1,250 years before the supposed birth of Jesus. Addis was born on December 25th of the Virgin Nana. He was considered the only begotten son and killed for the salvation of humankind. His followers had a meal of bread that represented him. His priests were eunuchs. He was both the divine son and the father. On Friday, he was crucified on a tree He descended into the underworld. After three days, he was resurrected. Many Christian features trace back to ancient sun worship in the astrological zodiac. The sun made crops grow, brought warmth, gave light, and vanquished the terrifying predator-filled darkness. Little wonder it was worshipped as Savior and light of the world. The sun was seen to pass through 12 major star constellations during a 12-month year, giving rise to the four seasons in the cross of the zodiac. 
the sun was anthropomorphized, as were the star constellations. Notice the features of the Egyptian sun god Horus, 3000 BC, as compared to modern day Christianity. Horus was born on December 25th. He was born of a virgin. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east. He was adored as a savior by three kings. He was a child teacher in a temple, baptized at 30 and began his ministry, had 12 disciples, called a lamb, lion, and identified with a cross, was part of a trinity, performed miracles like healings, water walking, creating a fishing bounty, seven loaves feeding a multitude, raising people from the dead. He was known as Truth, the Light, God's Anointed One, the Lamb of God. He was betrayed by a friend, crucified, and was dead for three days, and was resurrected, and was to have a millennial reign. The symbols in the zodiac are not just an artistic tool to track the sun, stars, and seasons. The zodiac doubles as a pagan religious symbol. For example, the bright star in the east is Sirius, which on December 24th aligns with the three kings. These stars in Orion's belt point to the sunrise on December 25th. Thus, the three kings follow the bright star in the east to locate the sunrise. The birth of the sun could be spelled S-U-N or S-O-N in this case. This mimics the events surrounding the Christmas story. There are 12 parts of the astrological zodiac. And notice that there are 12 disciples of Jesus, 12 tribes, kings, judges, and princes of Israel, 12 brothers of Joseph, and Jesus was at the temple at the age of 12. Jesus is often shown superimposed on the sun in the middle of the astrological cross. And incidentally, the Romans crucified people on stakes not crosses, if for no other reason than the impracticality of building stable crosses. In the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, there are most especially common themes and doctrines. Christianity morphed out of Judaism and paganism, and Islam morphed out of both Judaism and Christianity. Judaism morphed out of the pagan religion preceding or concurrent with it, such as the monotheistic Zoroastrianism. Christianity thus appears as an amalgam of Jewish, Greek, and pagan beliefs. Since the early Christians lived among these cultures, it's little wonder that the people in the times would influence the Jesus story. There was also a practical aspect of this plagiarism. Christian states found it useful to adopt beliefs of the people they conquered to help assimilation and decrease the potential for rebellion. Now, although this information was new to me, it was by no means new. For example, Higgins was born in 1772 and lived to 1833. In his Anacalypsis concluded, and I quote, one thing is clear, the mythos of the Hindus, the mythos of the Jews, and the mythos of the Greeks are all at bottom the same. And what is called their early histories are not histories of humankind, but are contrivances under the appearance of histories to perpetuate doctrines. Most astonishing is the fact that a number of writers in the first four centuries, including Christians, knew of the plagiarism. For example, St. Justin Martyr, 100 CE, a pagan turned Christian, attempted to defend Christianity in the face of pagan claims that Christianity was nothing more than a rehash of their gods. Being well aware of pagan beliefs, Martyr didn't deny this, but rather defended Christianity with his absurd diabolical mimicry argument, namely that uh, Satan read the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and imitated Christ in the form of pagan gods prior to Jesus. In other words, any parallels to paganism is the devil's doing and should create no doubt that Jesus was God and did the things said of him and uniquely did them. But pagan writers such as Celsus would have none of it. Pagans were used to syncretism, which is the amalgamation of different religions among pagan religions and easily recognized Christian plagiarism. Clearly, if Bible-based religions are truth and not human-made, they should stand alone, be unique and historically first. So it is shocking to learn that the mythological pagan gods anathematized and ridiculed by Christendom were antecedents to all of Christendom's doctrines. 
This devastated my belief that the Bible was the Creator's truth. It was merely a human-made artifice to legitimize human-made religions. Thank you for listening. Keep in mind that solving the big questions requires foundations upon which truthful answers can be built. So please work through the series sequentially. This information has taken decades of research, thought, and writing. Aside from the peace of mind the solutions have brought me, the only reward I seek is hearing that it's helped you. Feel free to contact me with any comments or questions at asifthinkingmatters.com.